Uh, so we've just had an excellent talk on indistinguishability obfuscation. Um, I want to talk about black box obfuscation. So that was this perhaps somewhat more ambitious goal. Um, so to recap, the setting is we have some classical functionality implemented by a circuit C. We'd like to map it to some encrypted circuit or some obfuscated circuit C, which satisfies two properties. So one, it ought to be useful, uh, by which I mean, given the encoding of C and some input X, I would like to be able to evaluate C at the input X. And two, so this was property one. And property two was that any interaction with this encoded circuit can be simulated using black box access to C. Uh, so as was pointed out, it's not exactly clear how we would formalize this. What does it mean to simulate some interaction with this data using black box access? This doesn't fit into the normal model. Um, and besides, this is sort of known to be impossible classically for any reasonable notion of simulation. So we should settle for indistinguishability obfuscation, which hides everything that it's possible to hide. The approach I'm going to take instead is to imagine that this obfuscation is a quantum state. So this does two things. One is it allows us to get around the classical impossibility result. A second one is that it actually gives us a very nice notion of what, what we mean to simulate this interaction. Right? Namely, I can say any measurement can be simulated. Right, so from my perspective, I have this quantum state. Um, I have some instruments that are designed to measure the state. Uh, for all I know, that quantum state isn't really a quantum state. Inside it, there's some simulator who has black box access to this functionality C. And whenever I make a measurement, he's just telling me what the measurement result ought to be. And if this were the case, then I think we could say in some very strong sense that interacting with this quantum state is no more useful than interacting with a black box which implements that functionality. Um, although certainly we'll be have, have to be very careful if we want to compose this with anything else. Um, and throughout, I'm going to be talking about computationally bounded interaction, uh, computationally bounded simulators, and uh, computational indistinguishability for the results. So feel free to ask if you have any questions about the model. Sorry, what does the black box do in this case? Uh, so C was some classical functionality. So the black box was just to submit X, you learn the value of C at X. Okay. So, yeah, so that will not be, I mean, it's going to be completely unclear what the security of the scheme is. The rest of the talk is going to consist of a presentation of a scheme which plausibly meets this guarantee and some discussion. It will not be clear what the security guarantee is. It's not clear if you obfuscate two circuits if the obfuscations interact appropriately. Uh, not automatically. You might be able to do some quantum, like some unitary transformation that combines your two obfuscations. So this guarantee in itself wouldn't be, wouldn't be okay. Yeah. So did I understand it right that in point two you kind of model the state as a, um, a machine and you have to send to it like commands like I do this unitary, I perform a measurement in that basis, and it's actually the simulator sitting there. So yeah. essentially I put the quantum state in another room, and in fact, there is no quantum state. And I, by phone, I call the experimenter what to do. And if, in one setting, there is an, uh, a real experimenter, and the other a simulator. That's exactly that, right. So you can, you can also have some quantum workspace, if you like. And the simulator will also be running that workspace. Um, so another interesting possibility that comes up in this case, and which also didn't exist in the classical case, was that this, this obfuscated circuit may not even be copyable. So I may be able to produce, this is an idea that Scott Aronson first raised. Um, and this is all based in large part on joint work with Scott. Um, but it may be that if I give you this, this implementation of the program, you cannot produce two working implementations of C. So you just get one program. The program is really acting like a black box. You can't learn anything from it. And also, you can't um, produce two black boxes. Uh, so the basic approach is going to be based on um, those garbled circuits. 
that are perhaps familiar to many of us, or perhaps not. Um, the idea in a garbled circuit is that we take each wire of the circuit C, and for each wire, or to each wire, we associate a pair of secrets. One secret corresponding to the input 0, and one secret corresponding to the input 1. So for example, on this wire, I'll say we have S0, 0, and S0, 1. On this wire, we have S1, 0, and S1, 1, and so on. And similarly <coughs> to the internal wires, S3, 0, S3, 1, etc. So in a garbled circuit, for every wire, there's a pair of secrets. One secret corresponds to 0, one secret corresponds to 1. Um, I don't distribute those secrets with the garbled circuit. So ideally, the way in which a garbled circuit is used is I provide to the user or to someone exactly one of each pair of secrets corresponding to the input on which they want to evaluate that circuit. And I provide for each gate some data which allows me to take the secrets associated to the input wires and produce the secret associated to the output wire. So if this is supposed to be an AND gate, if you have the two secrets corresponding to one on the input wires, you should be able to use those in combination with the data I supplied to extract the secret corresponding to one on the output wire. Similarly, if you have the two secrets corresponding to zero, you should be able to extract the secret corresponding to zero and so on. So once you have in hand one secret for each of the input wires, you can sort of go through uh, recursively and compute the secret for every wire, <coughs> including the secret for the output wire. So we have S out 0, S out 1. You ultimately obtain exactly one of these two secrets. And then I also provide you some data which allows you to distinguish between these two secrets, which corresponds to learning the output of the circuit. Sorry, can I ask just a quick question? So, yes. Uh, sorry, I walked a little bit late. So this is sort of a quantum analog of a one-time program, right, in the sense that... So we can't actually make a one-time program, but we can make a program which you can sort of only have one copy one of. One measurement time. program. You could kind of this way, right? that, that um, well, so after you measure it, you can actually, you can undo, we can sort of can't stop you from measuring it, and then it sticks around, and you can measure it again later, if the measurement is deterministic. So actually, this program is just, you can use it just like an obfuscation of a, a classical obfuscation of a program, except any measurement you make can be simulated by the black box access, and maybe you can't copy it. That would be cool. So you're requiring that you get the output with certainty, so there's no degradation of the program state? Yeah, the program state will be exactly the same at the beginning and end. And maybe there'll be some exponential degradation, but or exponentially small degradation, but probably not. And so the basic framework we're going to try and use to do that is this uh, garbled circuit idea. The way in which we would use a garbled circuit for obfuscation, ideally, is we'd imagine we have some universal circuit. <coughs> we have some inputs that are program inputs, or a description of the program which we want to run. We have some inputs which are the real inputs to the program. <coughs> The person who wants to produce the obfuscated circuit supplies the secrets corresponding to the program which they want you to be able to run. So the inputs corresponding to C are provided. And then somehow, one out of two <coughs> of each of these is provided. And so if you have the inputs corresponding to the program, and you have one out of two of each of the actual input secrets, you can obtain the secret corresponding to the output. So this is the overall plan. <coughs> Using these two, you obtain secret corresponding to output. And then we'll give you some data that allows you to turn that secret corresponding to the output into either 0 or 1 depending on whether the circuit returns zero. So classically, this is not a sensical proposal for obfuscating a circuit, because what does it mean to give you some data which allows you to get exactly one of the two input secrets? It doesn't make any sense. Classically, if you were able to get one of the secrets for this wire on one execution, and then get the second secret for this wire on the second execution, you could just get both secrets. 
And if you have both secrets in this garbled circuit construction, then it just looks like a normal circuit. So the core problem will be, can we use quantum mechanics to somehow implement this plan, which didn't make any sense classically. So are there any questions about that plan, which I could potentially clear up? Uh, so this is going to involve three ingredients. Ingredient one is some way to do this non-interactive one out of two transfer. Again, is a primitive that really doesn't make any sense classically. And taken literally, it's also impossible quantumly. We can hopefully do it well enough. The second ingredient is some data to transform input secrets into output secrets. And the third step, some data to interpret the output wire secret. So what I would like to do is I'd like to provide some implementation of each of these three steps. So I think step one is probably the most mysterious seeming, so I'm going to start with that one. Right, so how can I provide some data to you which allows you to get exactly one out of two secrets, but not get both, and which you can use over and over again? So that is the ideal situation. We have some state psi, which I gave you. You can use the state to extract some secret one, or some secret zero. And you can use the state to abstract some secret one, but you can't extract both. So intuitively, you might hope that you could, say, encode secret zero in the position of some particle and encode secret one in the momentum of some particle. And then it would be possible to either measure S0 or measure S1, but not both. But as you said again, that you can use both over and over again. What exactly does that mean? Yeah, so one problem is if S0 and S1 are just two secrets, it's necessarily the case that if there's some measurement that extracts S0 with probability 1, I can just make that measurement and then recover my original state because it hasn't done any damage. Um, so it's sort of, if everything that's going on deterministically yields the output of the circuit, then I can always run this process, get the output of the circuit, rewind this process, and be back where I started, and then do it again. So that means that I can't, this, this is not an achievable goal. Right? I can't allow you to get one secret or another deterministically, but not both. Um, so the problem with this scheme was that you were deterministically extracting a secret. Uh, the thing we'd like to do is we'd like to have the secrets be, there could be several possible secrets, and you extract one of them stochastically. And this means that when you actually learn what the secret is, you will have done some damage to the input. So it's a little bit more clear. I'm going to provide you some state psi, such that using psi, you can either extract an element of one space, A0, or you can extract an element of a different space, A1. In fact, these are going to be uh, linear subspaces. Are linear subspaces of what? Yeah, so I'll work over F2 to the N. So I'm going to imagine now that for every wire, I have some vector space. And the secrets associated to that wire are two subspaces, which are typically going to be very sparse subspaces. And in order to do computation, what you need is not a description of the entire subspace. You just need a vector from that subspace. That's going to be the basic approach. <coughs> so as in the garbled circuit construction, we have two secrets or a pair of secrets for every wire. You can recursively, if you have an element from the appropriate subspaces, you can use them to get elements from the subspaces lower down the circuit. And eventually, at the end, you either get an element from this subspace or an element from that subspace. And I'll give you some data that lets you tell which one you got, and you've evaluated the circuit. Yeah. Are you talking about quantum spaces? Or really no, these are just, this is a subspace of F2 to the end. Okay. Uh, and you should imagine intuitively, yeah, the, the density of the subspace is very small, so exponentially small. So you're not told what the subspaces are, no. but, but everything in the subspace has the right behavior. So. Yeah, that's how it's, the subspace is a secret. And if you're, in fact, there's no way you can possibly recover the description of the subspace. Yeah, but it's, it's yeah. OK, so this is how I'm going to try and do step one. 
Uh, OK, you're right. I haven't described what this state is. I mean, there's a classical secrets. I want to give you some quantum state which allows you to recover exactly one of these two objects. But do you mean you can actually recover? Uh, you can recover either a vector in this subspace or a vector in that subspace. You can't get both. Because uh, when you recover it, if you actually get this vector, it will destroy your original state. So in fact, what this state is going to be, um, the state psi is just going to be um, the sum over all the vectors in the subspace of that vector. So I will give you a uniform superposition over elements of this subspace. If you want to recover a vector from this subspace, you can just measure from that superposition, and you get a uniformly random element from the subspace. And I'll take a 1 to be the orthogonal complement of these. So if I want to get out an element of a1, all I have to do is take the Hadamard transform of this and measure that. Basically, if I measure the position of this thing, I get a random vector of a0. If I measure the momentum, I get a random vector in the orthogonal complement. That's how I'm going to do this 1 out of 2 transfer. Uh, so in this case, let's imagine that both of these have a dimension like, n over 2. So for the input wire, these two subspaces are complementary, and they have like half of the dimension. So Paul, I'm sorry, I'm a little confused here. So you want, you want to be able to execute your program on any choice of multiple inputs. You want to execute it multiple times, right? Yeah. So That's going to be guaranteed automatically. So when I run, I'm going to do everything in evaluating the circuit in quantum superposition. Okay. At the end, I'm going to extract a bit 0 or 1. And that bit is going to be deterministic. So it's always, either always going to be 0 or always going to be 1, depending on what inputs I chose. And that guarantees that I can always uncompute everything I just did, end up back where I started, and then it will be fresh to use again. So, so I'm going to I talk about this as measuring, but you're not really going to be measuring. You're just going to be manipulating that quantity in quantum state position. OK. Sorry, that's a bit linguistically very unclear. All right, thank you. OK, so now I'm going to look at 3. Um, 3 is sort of very, very easy compared to 2, but it will be a building block that will let us do 2. Do you have a proof that uh, if you extract v0 that you can't get uh, v1? Is that good error correction? Uh, yeah, so that, that can be proved. I'm going to prove a, or talk about proving a much harder thing in one second. I don't, yeah. So that actually can be proved just by looking at the inner products between these states. You'd have to. What can be proved? That you can't get both an element of this and an that element you of cannot. this. Yeah. We need something much, much stronger than that naturally to make the scheme go. So for step three, I want to allow you to identify an element of this subspace or this subspace. So I want to provide, I want to provide this function from v to is v a member of a. And I'd like, you to, I'd like to give you basically an obfuscated form of this function so that you can use it as a black box to evaluate that membership, but you can't use it to evaluate anything else. Um, so. This is where we have to make some computational assumption. Uh, I don't know what the best one is. I can make one. I'm a little bit scared every time I like, use this assumption, because there's some probability someone in the audience will be able to break it. I tried a long time, and I couldn't. And that's really the best evidence I have that it's a good assumption. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick a random degree 3 polynomial, say p of x equals sum alpha i, j, k, x, i, x, j, x, k, such that p of v equals 0 for all v and a. Oh, well. So I'm going to choose a uniformly random polynomial which vanishes on this entire subspace. And it turns out that I can do that just by doing a change of basis so that A is supported on some unit vectors, um, picking random, like including each monomial uh, that vanishes on A with probability half, and then performing the change of basis back. And then my encryption is going to be a set so of. What's, what's supposed to be positive? 
Um, that will also be a. So, a minimal assumption is I've given you this set of polynomials. I would not. I want you now to be able to recover the identity of the subspace A. For example, if these were degree two polynomials, you could really just read off A from the polynomial. When they're degree three polynomials, I don't. It doesn't seem to be known how to do this. Oh yeah, this is all. This was a subspace of F two to the m. Okay, so I'm just going to assume this behaves like a black box. Frankly, if I could assume this and then prove this scheme secure, I would be in a much better position than I currently am. Uh, things are going to get, my assumptions are going to get more uh, tenuous by the end. I think the goal is basically proving security under this assumption. Uh, sorry, that was completely unclear. I give you a set of n such polynomials. You can then test membership by evaluating all of them. If they're all zero, you're in A. If you're not in A, then with the overwhelmingly high probability, you'll find a non-zero one. So essentially, you, have, you assume that this is an obfuscator for the set. It's an obfuscator, yeah, for this function. Yeah, yeah and to be clear, again, the obfuscator is test all of these, see how many of them are zero. You could also add noise if you wanted. Like, I could give you order n polynomials such that, like, 1% of them vanished on A, and then you could just check for statistics. Maybe that's harder to break. I don't know. So even assuming this is a black box, the security of the scheme is going to be, it's going to be a very hard query complexity problem, which is currently open. But here's a minimal question. Um, a minimal question is, if I give you A, which is the uniform superposition over elements of A, and I give you um, this encoding of a membership function for A, and an encoding of a membership function for the orthogonal complement of A. Right, I want the secrets for these input wires to be a pair of orthogonal um, of complementary subspaces. So a minimal question is if I give you this input data and I give you these two membership functions, um, can you find an element of A and a dual simultaneously? you say um, minimal assumption, you mean an assumption that is necessary but not necessarily sufficient? Oh. If this were false, then the scheme would definitely, okay. definitely be destroyed. Maybe something that even more clearly necessary, um, we could say, can you produce the state A? But even this is not obvious. But that we can rule out. Yeah, so this is something I can't rule this out. But yeah, so Scott Ernst and I, have, in the paper on quantum money, um, showed this is not, you cannot produce such a state. Well, not without exponentially many queries to the yeah. Assuming that this encryption is a black box. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so the way this proof goes is one looks at sort of the execution of such a cloning algorithm in parallel on two subspaces which overlap but are not identical, and then sort of monitor the inner product between the, the states produced by those two algorithms. Over time, it can't drop much, but in order to clone, it has to drop a lot. Um, also, can I ask quickly how long this talk should be? It was originally budgeted for 30 minutes. Yeah. Okay. Um, plenty of time. OK, so this is going to be the data that I'm going to provide at the end of the game. So when we get to the last wire, this output wire, I'm going to use this membership oracle in order to decide whether I lie in the subspace corresponding to 0 or subspace corresponding to 1. I'm going to say nothing more than this is the only query complexity bound that I'm going to cite in the entire talk. Sorry. OK, so what remains is how to do the step 2. Um, 
I'm going to give a step whose security I can't analyze, but which I think at least looks plausible. So again, which one cannot very easily attack. So the setting is we have some gate. We have on the inputs two pairs of subspaces. We have on the output wire a pair of subspaces. I would like to give you some data which allows you to start from V in AI, <coughs> W in and then map to some uh, U in C G I comma J. G I J is the result of this gate applied to those inputs. So the question is just what data can I provide that allows you to do this without giving up the identity of these subspaces? Um, so intuitively, what we'd like to do is we'd like to have some random, we'd like to provide random linear maps. Fij from ai direct sum j to c j j. So recall that this was living in f2 to the n. This was living, these were living in f2 to the n. This direct project or direct sum lives in f2 to the 2n. So I'd like to just be able to provide some random linear map out of this direct sum into the appropriate subspace down here. And then you could run sort of all four of these functions, see which one corresponds to, um, see which one gives you a non-zero value or which one your input was in the domain of, and then take the corresponding output. So a problem with that approach is that it leaks the identity of the function that you used. If I give you these four independent functions and you get to see which of the four functions actually yielded a value, then you can run your circuit on two independent inputs. Um, for each one, learn which of these four functions sort of worked, which of the four functions returned a non-zero value. Um, and as a result, figure out whether the two inputs involve the same values on these wires, which would, be, which would break the security of the protocol. So what we need to do is we need to allow you to compute this output, but make it so that if you observe any fact about how the output was computed, it destroys the inputs to the circuit. Right? That's our challenge. So we want to make it so that as you evaluate the function, if you learn anything non-negligible, it will damage your inputs enough that before you've learned anything about the whole circuit, you've destroyed your inputs entirely. I think I've gone over time. Um, sorry. Five minutes. Five more minutes? OK, so I'll just provide the scheme. So idea one is that f inverse, fij inverse of Rather, this is a linear subspace. The set of x in ai plus vj such that fij of x has kth coordinate 1 or kth coordinate 0. This is a linear subspace. And so we're assuming that I can manufacture membership oracles uh, for these subspaces. Let's call these subspaces, I don't know, d, i, j, k. So one thing I could do, which we've just asserted wouldn't work, would be to provide for each pair ij, so 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, and each value of k, all n values of k, I could provide one oracle, which would tell you membership for in d i j k. So I could give you this big grid of input values, um, or of membership oracles. If I gave you this grid and you were given a vector, um, you could run the vector through all of these membership oracles. And most one of these rows would contain any, non, um, any non-zero values. You would take that row and you could just read off fij of your input from the results of the membership oracles in that row. And then the i coordinate, so your output should be 1 if um, all of these oracles return true. 
rather it should be zero if all these oracles return true and one otherwise. So if something in fact has value zero, then one of these will return true and the rest will return false. If it has value one, they'll all return false. So I can use this set of 4K um, or 4N membership oracles to evaluate my function. So I can use it to go from this pair of inputs to this output. This was not suitable because I can tell which row I used. So I can tell which row um, my input wires correspond to. For example, if this row has non-zero values, then it must be the case that the inputs were 0, 1, which is too much information for me to learn. Uh, so there's a very simple change to make to fix that, which is just randomly this output only depends on the count of ones in this column. So I can just go through every column and randomly permute the membership oracles in that column. Okay. Uh, and that's all the data I'm going to give you. So using that data, you can then compute for any elements in um, any of these four subspaces formed as direct, direct sums, you can find the appropriate element in the output, or in the secret corresponding to the output bar. OK, so I think I'm out of time and have run over. That was a very brief explanation. It's possible if I can answer a small number of questions to clarify, I should do that. But otherwise, thank you. Any questions? I was wondering, is this already written up or published or not? Uh, I have no guarantees. I worked for a long time trying to prove guarantees. I should probably just give up and no, no, I, mean, up. I don't have a write-up. Sorry? I don't have a published you don't have one. So let's thank Paul again.